Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Wanda Pratt um, from across the lake over at UW. Uh, we've actually been trying to get Wanda over here for a couple of months, but due to various scheduling constraints on both sides of the lake, it's taken a little bit, it's taken a little bit longer than we uh, we have hoped. But hopefully, now that we've broken the ice, we'll see her over here a lot more. Um, so Wanda has an interesting um, background. She's got a computer engineering and computer science um, undergrad and masters. Um, and then a medical informatics uh, PhD from Stanford University. She's now an associate professor out at UW, uh, where she holds appointments both in the iSchool um, as well as the biomedical and health informatics uh, department or division, I guess. Um, turning into a department. Turning into a department. <laughs> she runs the I iMed lab and does a bunch of consumer uh, health informatics work, which she's going to talk to us about today. So all yours, Wanda. Great. Thanks, Disney. Um, Feel free to jump in at any point with questions. I love to have interactive types of talks. So today I'm really going to talk about one of our big projects and note that this work is work that's been done by my large team of people, students, postdocs, undergraduates, and so on. So today we're going to talk about the notion of personal health information management. So even if I don't think a lot of you are health informatics researchers, but probably managing health information either already is touching your lives or will touch your lives at some point in the future, either for yourself or for one of your loved ones. And so the, the issue is how can we really understand um, this problem and how does this relate to a lot of the current effort in personal health records? So when you think about managing your health information, a lot of people think about, uh, you know, keeping track of your weight, your blood pressure, the medications you're on, those kinds of things that are all kind of in the realm of what we call personal health records. Whether we're talking about the independent kind of ones like Microsoft's and, well, Google's getting out of it now, but, or um, ones that come out of the big medical record companies that are now trying to produce um, personal health records um, connected to clinics or some that are connected to maybe your healthcare provider, whether you're in the VA or, or some of the other healthcare systems. A lot of these are now entering into this realm of personal health records. So the question is, when people need to manage their personal health information, is that really um, just what's supported by personal health records? And in case any of you have never seen a personal health record, just to get a sense of it, this is a screenshot from Microsoft's product. So we're talking about all these kinds of things like your medications, um, some details about your health status, um, whether you have allergies, and family history information, which is, which is the kinds of things you think of, certainly when you're talking about your health information. But we're talking about something a little bit more general. So I think it'll help here to think of a particular scenario. Let's consider Sue. And let's say Sue is a lot like us. She has a successful career. I mean, she's a successful researcher. She has a family. She has lots of things going on in her life that are important to her. But now she has cancer. Um, and how is she going to deal with that? Well, one aspect that you traditionally think of in managing your health information is trying to keep track of everything, right? You're, you're looking at integrating information from your insurance company, what's covered, what's not covered. You're talking to the, the cancer center. Um, you're talking to your primary care doctor. You're trying to keep track of all of this information. Um, there's things at home where you're trying to keep track of your insurance or what's happening. Um, the rest of your life is still going on. And the patient is really here at the center. Um, she is really responsible for managing all of this information. And then if we go on and think about the rest of her life, um, she also has to coordinate her treatment plan. So she's getting chemotherapy at the cancer center. But she feels pretty crappy when she's done with her chemotherapy and she needs somebody to give her a ride home. So she has to 
coordinate things with a, a friend who drives her. So she's got to coordinate her calendar with her friend's calendar. She's got to keep her friend up to date on the appointment. She's got to coordinate that with what, what's available at the, at the clinic. Um, she wants to keep up with the rest of her life, too. Maybe she's got a Kai Best Paper Award, and she wants to go to that. So can she plan her treatment, um, keep track of how she's reacting to things to try and and, and make sure she's well enough to go to that or to her best friend's wedding or so on. The whole point is that people who are patients are people too. They've got lots of things going on in their life. And so the issue is how can we really um, help them maintain the rest of their life while they're a patient too and really effectively deal with their information. Unfortunately now, there aren't a lot of tools to help them. There are all the PHRs that are out there. But still, we've had a, a large sense of people being overwhelmed by this information, not knowing how to organize it, not having the, the tools, the time, the, um, the energy to deal with it. And this has some pretty negative consequences um, in terms of people feeling overwhelmed and therefore stressed. There's a strong correlation with stress and negative health outcomes. Um, they disconnect from their care. They're too overwhelmed with how many decisions they have to make. So they just say, you do it. You choose. And there's lots of studies that show you know, poor decisions happen in those cases because you're the one who knows what's important to your life. If you're not involved in that and checking up on it, things are not going to turn out as well as they could have otherwise. So we see this as a, as a very important problem. And that's the motivation for the project that, that we've been working on. So our project, um, the research that comes out of our project, has really centered a lot on um, studying patients' information work. So it's really more of an understanding users' contribution. But as part of that work, we are also developing new kinds of technology. We've developed a system called HealthWeaver, um, where we've taken the, the knowledge that we've learned from our users and developed um, a system to try and address some of the, the problems that we've seen that patients have. And then we're evaluating um, this kind of technology in the, in the field. So as part of this study, we've done, used a variety of different methods, um, one of which is really taking advantage of observational and interview um, types of methodologies. We did a six-week study with 15 breast cancer patients where we observed them in their home, interviewed them, um, took photos and inventories of all of their management um, systems and styles for their health information, followed up with critical incidents on the phone to talk about how they were dealing with particular situations that were bothering them. We also know that in the clinic is a primary time where people have a lot of information to manage and a lot of information is flowing at them quite quickly. So we did observations within the clinic as well, followed up again with um, critical incidents that we found and more um, observations and interviews in the home. We also firmly believe in incorporating the patients into the design team. Um, Meredith helped lead a lot of this. Um, Peja Klansha also worked on some of these things. So we've had a total of seven different design groups with patients or survivors. And on average, there are between two and six different patients that are, were part of our design team, as well as a couple of researchers as part of the, the participatory design sessions. And we set them up to be a real commitment. So there were three sessions that they would partake in. Each session was at least two hours long. And in between the sessions, they would have homework to do. Um, and by and large, we found that once they started in with our design groups, these patients were extremely engaged. Um, we were trying to have homework be about a 15 to 30 minute type of assignment for them. Some people spent days on it and produced like 20 pages of documents to help us with our research. Um, they were very excited and, and very interested in being involved in this, this kind of project. We've also done some field evaluations of taking the system we've developed and actually putting it in use. Um, a four-week study and a six-week study with patients. It has a, a mobile component as well as a, a web-based component. But today I'm going to focus on three different aspects of our research. 
And I'm focusing these on what distinguishes the kind of work we're doing from a lot of the work that's happening in personal health records. So in particular, we found that there was um, a large need for a social component to their information management. And none of the, the PHR systems are really thinking or focusing on that, that type of thing. We're talking about things from peer-to-peer -peer type of support where patients need help from other patients because other patients um, often have very valuable expertise to provide, as well as patients reaching out to their social network for help like drives to the clinic um, or meals when I'm too sick to, to help take care of things. We also found that um, mobile solutions were really important. Um, we have a, a paper we call Blowing in the Wind, and unanchored work, this notion that um, a lot of what happens for information work when you're a patient happens when you're not necessarily next to your computer. How many of you have had to wait for a phone call back from the doctor? Does it happen when you're not busy and right next to your computer? No, not for me it doesn't. It happens when I'm driving in my car or at the grocery store. Um, those kinds of things happen all the time when you're a cancer patient and you have to have a lot of interaction with the clinic. Therefore, we found um, certainly this notion of unanchored work or mobility to be pretty critical. And then also um, in the clinic, um, there's a, that's a pretty high stakes, high information throughput place. And um, we found some interesting things around um, the actual needs for patients there that aren't currently supported. So in this talk, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the, the social network aspects and the mobility and talk about how, what our findings are there and how it connects to the designs we've made. Um, I'll also talk about the, the, our findings in terms of understanding users and the situation in a clinic and that I'll use to focus a little bit more on some future work that I'd like us to do and maybe collaborate with some of you. So this is a uh, some screenshots from the system we've developed called Health Weaver. The idea is that it's trying to um, help people with this interwoven nature of their being a patient and the rest of their life, their work, their, their, um, their personal life, and so on. So having calendar as a primary integrator was certainly a key thing. Being able to, to keep track of and sense what's happening in their lives and their symptoms and so on as well as the social component up there, and also including the mobility aspect of things. And I'll, I'll talk some about the, the design choices that we've made for some components of this throughout the talk. So just as a quick overview, um, in the terms of the peer-to-peer -peer thing, um, we have done a lot of research that showed that the kind of help that patients get from other patients is really, and the kind of expertise that other patients have to offer, is really quite different from that expertise that you would expect from a clinician. And um, this is a very valuable source of information that patients aren't currently getting a lot of the time. Um, so for example, when a patient is trying to deal with working at the same time as getting treatment, the doctor is only so useful in that, whereas lots of other patients who've been through that are particularly helpful. Um, we did a lot of design work around this, but never built it out into a social network, partially because it's hard to start up a social network like that from scratch. So we now have uh, an NSF grant um, working with an existing cancer social network called Cancer Connect, and we're, we'll be working on that kind of um, building out those features in the future. So what have we done? So this particular portion of this comes out of Meredith Skeels' um, thesis work, and it was really looking at ways the social network can help the patient and what their real needs are here. The basic idea here is that there's already medical research that talks about how important this is. Um, we know that people who are socially connected and have strong support from their um, their network of friends and family actually have better health outcomes. They have better mental health outcomes. They have better physical health outcomes. Yet, from the psychology literature, we also know that these same people tend to underestimate the willingness of other people to help them. They also overestimate how hard it is for those people to help them. Um, 
So that's the challenge that, that we were looking at in the, the social component, the social network component. I'm not expecting you to read all of this, but just to get a sense of from our patients, um, our participants in our studies, we got a sense from them of how, what kind of help did you get? And the answer is all kinds of help. Um, whether it's from things that you think of being closely tied to their health, like um, rides to appointments or interpreting medical documents, um, all the way to things that are not so clearly related, like uh, you know doing yard work and, and getting their groceries. But the problem is that these people um, are having a lot of difficulties um, dealing with their disease and living the rest of their life. So they appreciate help in all of these different kinds of arenas. But yet there's a, there's a problem here. How many of you have ever offered to help somebody um, in some health situation? Was it difficult to think of what to offer their help? Did they take you up on it? Some do, some don't. I mean, there's lots of studies that show that, you know, there's lots of people who say, oh, let me know if you need any help. But, but that puts the patient in kind of an awkward spot. They don't know, are you serious or were you just being nice? Um, what kind of help are you willing to give? Um, am I really burdening you? Is, is it okay for me to ask you to help me with grocery shopping? This just doesn't seem like it's connected to my cancer, but it's what I really need help with. So the problem here is that there is this, this gap between the support network that really does want to help and the patient who really needs help. And how do we connect them together? How do we um, cross this gap? So our plan was to, to build out some technology to try and help in this arena, um, mainly along four different different ways. One is to really make it clear to the people, the social network, what kind of help is needed. Um, what are the preferences of the person? Maybe the person's in a stage right now where they don't really want to be reminded that they have cancer and you can just leave them alone. Or maybe they're in a stage where they're totally overwhelmed and they need help with anything that you can possibly give them. Um, we also wanted to do things to try and make it easy both for the patient to ask for help um, to not feel like they're burdening their social network, but to be clear and specific on things they need help with, and vice versa, for the social network to do the same, offer some specific kinds of help um, that they were willing to do. And really just set up a whole environment to make sure that the whole network is, is well informed and to really do what we call catalyzing this social support, creating this feedback loop where people are thanked and there's visibility of, of what's happening and people are reminded and ways to make this seamless and easy. Um, so that, that led to our catalyzing social support work. Now there is some other work along these lines. There's, you know, Microsoft Health Vault's personal health record has some kinds of sharing features in the, the sense that you can let some people have access to parts of your record. Um, there are other kinds of systems that have more blogging functionality, and um, there's a newer system that's a little more closely connected to some of the things that we were trying to do. But if you, if you look at the kinds of functionality that they offer, um, up at the top is more of a clustering of more the personal health record arena, where it's just, it's just going to give access to certain people, presumably very close people to you, um, your health information. Um, then in the middle, we have these clustering of features that are more like blogs. It's just ways to issue updates to certain people that you've put on your list. Um, and then there's the, the lots of helping hand system that tried to do a little bit of adding in some of these offering and asking for help. And then at, at the bottom is more the unique things that, that Health Weaver has to offer, as well as trying to mix in some of the offerings from personal health records in letting people have um, controlled access to some information. For example, if somebody's going to drive you to your doctor's appointment, they need to know when your doctor's appointments are. Um, if, um, if you want somebody to help, um, help cheer you up when you're depressed, having a sense of when you're in a down mood would be possibly helpful if you're willing to share those kinds of information. So we saw this whole um, 
connection across this as being very important. And again, um, some unique features offered by Health Weaver. So this is a screenshot um, example of how we decided to, to build out this particular component. Um, we decided to make it easier for people to actually uh, um, ask for help to actually have a bunch of templates. So we have uh, around 25 or 30 different kinds of templates that people can use and we categorize them into things related to appointments, daily living, fun stuff or problem solving. People can pick their category and pick any particular type of template they want and they get an automatically pre-filled email message that they can edit as they see fit. But a problem that people talked about a lot was this notion of you know, not knowing how to ask and it being too hard and overwhelming. So we were trying here to make it as easy as possible to, um, to make these requests happen. And note here that on all of the components of their system, we have privacy labels associated with them. So they have fine-grained control over who can see, may see these kinds of things. So you might only um, have a, a help request for changing the drains from my wounds to my female friends. Um, and you have that kind of control along those lines. Um, similarly, we set up a system for the friends, the social network, to be able to offer specific help as well. And so we thought they would also like to see templates of what other patients have found to be helpful so that they can make very specific offers of help. And so we have a similar kind of interface um, for them as well with predefined templates that they can customize as they see fit. And another key component that came up in our design sessions was this notion of thanking people who helped them. There was this overwhelming sense of um, gratitude towards the social network for helping them in their time of need. But there was also this overwhelming sense of, oh God, now I have to send them all thank you notes and I don't even have the time or the energy to do that. Um, but I feel desperately that they need to be thanked. So we, as part of our design sessions, we did a lot of brainstorming of how to make this easier and visible. Um, and they came up with some really interesting ideas. Um, one person's homework um, came out of her church, where they have a cross at her church. And they had um, little sticky notes that were associated with particular families in need. And people could go up and take a piece of that cross and make it their own and really take care of the family in need. So the design team tried to think of some more agnostic way to try and deal with this idea, and they came up with the notion of a heart, because it's a caring heart that made a lot of sense. Um, so that's what the, the, um, the design team with the patients came up with. Later on, we decided that that wasn't very practical. You can't divide a heart into infinite pieces and things. So we turned that into more of a helping quilt that makes it easy to um, expand or contract as needed, um, and have pictures that ended up um, being up there showing who helped you. So this had the advantage of the patient feeling very well taken care of. They can see this quilt of all the people who are helping them. And it also served as an automatic way to thank them. Because now the helpers could see their faces on here as people who are contributing to this person. And the broader social network, if permissions were set up appropriately, could also see this and could serve as kind of a motivating feature too of, you know, oh, so-and-so helped um, Sue, I want to help Sue too and, and I'll get a piece up here and get socially acknowledged for, for being a nice, helpful person. So we thought that was a one nice way to address that particular concern of patients. So next I'm going to transition from the, the social component to more this notion of unanchored work and um, the sense that patients have of being lost in a sea of information and not necessarily connected to their, their desktop. Uh, and this work has extended from um, explaining in detail kind of what this problem is, what this unanchored work is all about, to some actual design work 
and mapping the space of what's already being done out there in this um, mobile health world. So in some ways you can say, well, this happens to me anyway in my life. Right? And personal information management is all about this, right? We get lots of information coming at us wherever we are. Um, but it, when you're a patient, you have some unique situations that make that even harder than it is for us in our real lives in terms of just the fact that you have the disease. Particularly cancer causes things like diminished um, attention um, spans, um, you're in a lot of pain, uh, there's known side effects of chemotherapy is messing with your ability to remember things. Um, there's also the fact that, like we talked about before, the clinic could contact you any time or place or you could encounter things that are relevant. Um, there are patients that talked about going to the grocery store and seeing a supplement they'd heard of and wanting to ask their doctor about it, but not having any way to kind of keep track of all that information and make sure that they brought it up again when they saw their clinician. And then we have the added problem of this is new to them. They don't know all these terms. Um, CMF is a kind of chemotherapy, tamoxifen is a hormone drug, um, Nottingham is a staging approach. I mean, these are all new words, they're new things, and there's, there's stress of getting this kind of a diagnosis and, and you know, what's this going to do to my life? Um, am I going to die? And so on. These make um, the challenges that we all feel in, in the rest of our life in managing information even more important and problematic. So we, we looked at that and um, decided that a couple of the key important design constraints was really to make um, quick capture be a high priority as well as very easy retrieval. So you see a lot of similar things to the personal information management work that happens, um, but making it tied to health issues and um, how knowing that this is a health problem um, can enable us to, to make certain design decisions. So what we did was, we, um, this is part of Peja Klansha's dissertation work, um, we created a, um, a mobile app on an Android phone that's a combination native mobile app, so native component to be able to access some central features like cameras and the, that kind of thing, and web-based to be able to connect to the, the overarching health weaver system that people are using from their desktop. So the basic idea with Quick Capture is we wanted people to be able to easily capture in one place um, anything as they were thinking of it, whether it be text notes, non-trivial on a tiny keyboard, but, but people did use text notes, um, or more commonly audio and, and um, photos of things. So we had several patients who did take photos of things in the stores, like their supplements, um, or um, audio record a quick note um, as they were going to bed. It wasn't even necessarily as they were out and about, but having their phone with them all the time really helped to, um, to make that easy for them. And then to accomplish this notion of easy retrieval is the whole notion that Health Weaver is connected to is this notion of linking things together. Um, being able to connect that um, note that I just took, whether it's a photo or an audio, to the appointment in which I want to discuss this with my doctor. So being able to connect these things up together so when it comes time for your appointment, all those things are right there for <coughs> you. You don't have to go search for, now where was that picture of the supplement that I took? Well, it's here. You're at your appointment and it's connected right there. And going along with the idea of um, making retrieval easier, our work and some other work in medical informatics have really found that patients use calendaring as a central way to organize their information. Because a lot of things happen that way in terms of appointments you have, reminders for picking up kids that are connected to, um, reminders of prescriptions, those kinds of things often are all tied to the calendar. So we knew that having tight calendar integration would be an important feature. So the way we set that up was to have in these links back to our Health Weaver system. So 
Within here, within your appointment, you can see links back to the Health Weaver system for the content that you wanted to have available to you at that, at that meeting. So here you can see um, links to a New York Times article that was relevant to the treatment plan that you have that you found when you were surfing the web and just connected it up to your appointment. Uh, question list that you put together for that appointment. Maybe a photograph of the supplement and so on. So the idea was to have it all integrated together. And then uh, another component that we found to be very useful was um, people wanted to keep track of what was happening to them. And although they could go to their desktop at the end of the day and try to remember these things, it was actually much easier for them if we had some easy ways for them to note how they're feeling. We call these self-check-ins. So I had some notions of them being able to list things like how well they're coping, what their energy is, their pain levels, and so on and then have ways for them to easily both enter the information and then see it. A lot of our participants use this information then back in their clinic visits to communicate to their doctor um, just how badly or, or well they're feeling um, in getting the help that they needed. We had several patients who talked to us about um, knowing that they were feeling a little bit more pain, but having that um, daily log of that made it much easier for them to go to their doctor and say, hey, the last time I took chemotherapy, yes, I was in some pain, but that was only a three, and now I'm at a seven, so this is worse. This is definitely worse. I need something else to help with this. Um, and found that this kind of detailed tracking <coughs> was actually quite useful in getting the support that they needed. Um, and then we also looked at this notion of how broad the health information is and needing access to this variety of things, not just the prescriptions, which are often in personal health records, but also um, all the different kinds of documents from their tracking needs to literature that they found on the web to be helpful and so on. And again, we had ties back to the web-based system so that um, what your daily check-ins and so on could be totally customized. Each patient is very individual and has different preferences for what they're interested in. So this level of customization to be able to, to note what they wanted to keep track of when became very important as well. So that was a, a summary of the, the mobility aspect of our work. Now I'm going to transition into talking about what happens in those clinic visits and why that is a, a critical part, and talk some about um, some of our ideas for future work for addressing some of these issues. So a lot of this came out of our work where we were actually doing observations in the clinic, looking at what, what is happening in this environment, and, and how intense are the information needs, and what exactly are these information needs. So the first thing that came up is that there are really challenges across the board. There's challenges when you're getting ready for the appointment. There's the fact that the doctors here have their own agenda. They, they know this is your third chemotherapy appointment. Um, now we're going to have to make a decision on what hormone therapy you're going to be on. Do they communicate that to the patient? Not usually. Um, so they have their own agenda of what's going to happen in that visit but the patient has no idea. They don't know what they should come in prepared for um, or not. And vice versa also happens. These clinic visits are really important to the patients. They often spend a lot of time working with family and friends, crafting question lists, doing research, deciding exactly what is the most important thing to talk to their doctor about in that short little visit that they have that lots of important decisions are made. Um, so there's a real problem here of both parties have some information well ahead of time of the visit, but there's nothing being shared here, and, and that's a real big problem. <clears throat> we also did some work looking at what was being conveyed during the visit, and we found that doctors talk fast, um, and this is a real problem. So we. Um, in our transcripts, we timestamped everything, so we were able to keep track of this information. <clears throat> and just to let you know that normal speech is about 125 words per minute. 
And that's when you're not in this high, intense emotion space. It's not when you've got new terms flying at you. It's not when you're making life or death decisions. But here, they're talking at almost twice that speed. And I have a little clip I want to share with you. Um, I didn't have human subjects permission to do share actual audio. So this is the actual transcript spoken by me and my husband at the um, right, uh, right speed. Whoops. Let's start at the beginning. There you go. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? My name is Dr. Smith. I'm one of the oncologists for the working on I'm going to talk to you and examine you, and then Dr. Jones is coming. So, I had a chance to look at what has been happening with the left side of breast cancer, and it was no positive. It was estrogen receptor positive, and HER2 negative. Not against me. And now we're seeing you for new adjuvant CMS, which is chemotherapy. Okay, um... For a new What did you say? I missed it entirely. So that's a real transcript excerpt, and this is this is not an unusual thing. This is what happened in almost every clinic visit. Um, so that was spoken at about 200 words a minute. Sometimes they spoke even faster than that. Um, mm -hmm. As you can see, <clears throat> I don't know. Did you catch all the new words that were flying at you? Um, it's pretty challenging to try and really follow what's happening in this, in this environment. So patients clearly need some help in processing what's happening here and keeping track of the information that's conveyed. <clears throat> they did sometimes to try and deal with that issue because they knew it was happening. They would bring in notebooks to try and keep track of notes. They would bring in people with them to, keep, to take notes. Um, but we uh, notice a lot of problems there as well. We have um, some particular quotes. We had one participant who um, couldn't remember why she'd recorded information about a genetics textbook. She had a note about it, but she didn't remember much about what that was about. Was this because it was relevant to her? Was this because it was going to influence her treatment? She, she didn't know. Um, there were times when the actually multiple times when the person taking the notes and the patient had different memories of what happened. Um, there were several times here, um, in particular, one participant um, thought that the uh, doctor said you should, you should take tamoxifen therapy, and the person taking the notes thought the doctor said the opposite, that you should not take tamoxifen. And they didn't really know how to deal with this. Um, they call the doctor back. Do they wait until the next visit? Um, how are they going to resolve some of these conflicts that are happening? So even after the visit, if they tried their best to, to keep track of that information, it was still challenging for them to um, integrate that back into their, their life and the real decisions that were happening. So we see this as a prime area for work that's needed. Um, and we're We've written a couple of grant proposals to try and work on this area as well. Some of our ideas <clears throat> include trying to set up this kind of a common information space that's been talked about in CSTW literature, but ways where, I mean, these could be very simple ways of just being able to share agendas. Um, clinicians, um, even having staff, and we're looking at um, how automated this whole process can be. There are certain trajectories that people go through in their treatment plan, and a lot of that can be mapped out ahead of time and known and made available to the patient, even without any intervention from the clinic staff. And then the patients and their family and friends could also upload their question lists and their priorities for the agenda to enable some agenda negotiation at the start and make sure that both people are aware and prepared for this important um, visit that's happening. So for example, can we have the agenda available on, on some kind of a, a tablet device to make it easy for both parties to see their agendas, to make it easy to capture, potentially, audio, what's happening in these um, important high-stakes visits? Um, so for example, we've mocked up a, a design of being able to connect 
like through Health Weaver, um, some of the important documents that the patient is bringing to the visit with the agendas, being able to bookmark parts of the audio to go back to components of um, where different parts of the agenda were being discussed. And that can just be as simple as when they're ticking off items on the agenda, the system can easily note um, when things are being discussed for easier retrieval. So overall, I just wanted to provide a, a big picture view of one kind of project that um, my <coughs> research group has worked on. And we really did find that a lot of the work that patients do in managing their health information is more than what you just find in a personal health record. It has a lot of this social component, whether it's talking to other patients with expertise or coordinating with your social network to get the help you need, um, or from the ability to be mobile and to keep track of information on the fly when you need it, where you need it, as you need it, as well as what we see is this, this critical hole in dealing with the clinic space when we have this problem of so much information is being conveyed and it's a precious time, but there's very little support there for the patient, um, even and the clinician, to, um, to make this as effective and efficient as possible. So a lot of that work has, um, the understanding users work has fed into the development of our, our Health Weaver system. And we hope that tools like these and other researchers can build on our findings to develop these kinds of technologies to really support patients' health information work and really allow them to live the rest of their lives as a mom, a researcher, or whatever, and not spend as much time being overwhelmed and stressed and worried about their health information, looking at ways that we can try and support this and, and ease that burden. So I want to thank you and, and my large team and funding agencies that, that helped make uh, this work possible. Thank you. Good time for questions. Um, so I'm curious, so a lot of the patients that you, know, you mentioned on your slides and you said yourself that a lot of the problems that they came up with were kind of organizational and management and coordinating all forms of care and stuff like that. I'm, I'm curious as to, I mean, these systems seem, seem really great, and I'm, but I'm wondering that is there also an, an industry perhaps of like, you know, consultants you can hire as, as care managers and coordinators? Because it seems like there might be a human role here too. Yeah, actually there are, especially in cancer care, there's this um, notion of a, a patient navigator, they're called. Um, and so some people have been able to hire um, um, a patient navigator. Oftentimes these patient navigators are patients, I mean are survivors, so they've been through the process. I would say the best navigators are sometimes um, previous patients so they know what to expect, what kinds of problems can arise, um, and that kind of thing. And so yeah, um, although that kind of service is, is not always cheap or, or yeah, easy to come by, um, but, but certainly there are very valuable roles. And some of the, we had a patient advisory board too, and a patient navigator um, was on our patient advisory board, was part of guiding our work as well. And there might, I was just thinking that there might be a way to have the best of both worlds. Like, they, you know, they could be something that fits into your health weaver system where maybe you get a smaller slice of their time, but they, you know, they drop it. Like, health weaver helps you decide when you actually need a human coordinator, and then you get a smaller slice of their time, so you pay less. Um, but they can help with those really critical things that's just beyond the of Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, humans are very valuable. Right? Yeah. And, whether it be these professional patient navigators or your, your social network and your family and friends and so on. From the bioinformatics perspective, I could also imagine that these daily charts that people doing self-check-ins, that if that information could actually flow back to the researchers, you'd get valuable information that currently is not at all there. Yeah, absolutely. And there are some sites that are trying to do some of that. Patients Like Me is a, a pretty well-known site where um, patients can upload their data and actually drug companies and so on pay for that anonymized version of that data to try and, and look at that. Um, we also think it would be very valuable to feed back to the patients so that they can see, okay, well, yeah, 80% of the people always have pain 
two days after chemotherapy. This is normal. It's not something I should panic about. This is, this is a, not a big deal. Or vice versa, right? Okay, only 5% of the people have this kind of a side effect there. Maybe this is something I really should talk to my doctor about. Um, so this notion of sharing quantified data, I think, could be quite valuable. And we're, we're talking with um, patients like me about some collaborations along those lines. Jamie. Have you talked with clinicians at all? Since clearly, I mean, I know they have, they may talk very fast because they have limited time or, you know, not have time to set up or prepare an agenda in advance. Or. Yeah, we have talked to clinicians and um, one of the co-investigators is an onco a breast oncologist at SCCA. And I, I think part of the issue is that they're not aware so one of the things we're also looking at is there are ways to give them feedback. This is a standard spiel for them. And that's how they talk about, think about it, right? It's like, okay, this is just a patient with stage three breast cancer, this is what we do. And so they have this thing in their head of, this is what I tell a person with stage three breast cancer. And you know, as well as I do, when you, you say things over and over again, you get faster and faster at it. And, and that's what's happening. And that's what the feedback that they gave us too was that, while I had no idea I was talking that fast, no wonder they're having a hard time um, understanding me. But it is something that, you know, I get in my pattern of this is the kind of my audio recording of what to say, and that's just what they do. And so in some sense, they would actually like some real-time feedback of, hey, um, I'm dominating the discussion. We're, we're talking with uh, another oncologist who specializes in um, patient um, provider communication and trying to give them some real-time feedback in terms of how much are they dominating the conversation, how long has it been since the patient last talked, um, how quickly am I speaking, all of those kinds of things to help not just um, talk to them afterwards, which is what's usually happened now, is that there's a person who sits in with them and does kind of an evaluation of how well they communicate with patients and then give them feedback afterwards, but can we give them the feedback when it matters? so that they can make a difference right then and change some. There are constraints of how much time they have and so on, but a lot of times they were not um, very cognizant. I've doctors who have not wanted their patients to be particularly well informed, yes. who are like, oh, you're searching the internet, don't do that. Or, you know, and, or who are like, we know what the right decision is, it's not my job to communicate it to you, I my time would be better spent saving other people's lives as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're absolutely doctors like that. I tend to avoid those. <laughs> um, um, but uh, I think some of that also stems from problems of patients bringing these articles off the street. They, the doctors have no idea where this is coming from. Sometimes it's a printout without even knowing the source at all. Um, if we can have some way to set up expectations or communicate some of um, what's going on ahead of time so both parties could be a little bit prepared, that might help ease some of that. There are still going to be the kinds of practitioners who are not interested in, in practicing that way. But at least in a lot of my research, I found that a lot of times it's not maliciousness. It's really cluelessness. A style. <laughs> Yeah. And there are very different communication styles, and some patients want that, actually. Some patients, there are studies that talk about the different styles. Some patients want to go into a visit and have the doctor tell them exactly what to do because they don't want the responsibility of researching that. They don't, they don't want to know all the details. They just want to be told what they should do and do it and be done with it. So that is true. How often do people record just their clinical interviews and are doctors amenable to that? Yeah, well, I mean, it probably depends on the place, but here at um, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, the, they will actually audio record your first visit. Um, they just do it, and then they hand you the tape at the end. Um, because they found this to be an overwhelming time, they only do it for the first visit. That's usually a, a very intensive one where there's lots of specialists coming in, and so they... Um, you know, whether it's the surgeon and the, the radiation oncologist and the medical oncologist. Um, so they're at least used to being audio recorded and, and open to that. And also if you look at a lot of the um, 
support groups, online support groups, that's like the number one thing that everyone says to do. Bring an audio recorder to your visit. If your doctor isn't comfortable with it, find a new doctor. Actually, it brings me a question. When I was pregnant, actually, I asked to record the ultrasound because it's kind of fun. But uh, they just freaked out and said, yeah. "You cannot record this thing. Like, you know, you cannot record what you're seeing." So uh, it's actually quite interesting. Huh. Yeah, it's it's interesting you mentioned from all the interactions that we had working uh, in the medical space from the in, in health world, almost 85 to 90 percent of the doctors did not want themselves to be recorded. Yeah. yeah. Because then they're like, oh, what were they saying? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there, there are some cultural issues here. Probably in oncology, there's a little bit more of a, a standard of that that's going to happen, partially because there's so many new terms and it's so high stakes. Maybe that they're a little bit more amenable to that. But it would be certainly be nice to push the trend to, to be allow more patient recording of exactly what's happening. I mean, it's you're paying for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's your body. Um, why can't you do this? And actually, a lot of the laws now, um, they don't address that particular issue, but there's certainly a push towards more openness to patients and more ability to, to have control over exactly this uh, You mentioned an access to, uh, to the uh, do uh, doctor's schedule for the patient. Now, in most professions, they keep a few, at least a few black market slots for really bad weather that nobody knows about until the, the world collapses. How happy would doctors be to let patients see their entire schedule? Um, a lot of systems actually are doing that now, and then they build into that schedule. I mean, you don't necessarily, you, you can't display whose appointment it is. So they have fictitious appointments, right? This is an emergency spot that's left open in this is So the patients just see these as marked as full and have no sense that this is a reserve time, which is important and valuable. I mean, when you have emergencies, you want to get in too. So, you have a question or? Yeah, so, so there's a big difference between allowing a patient to record something privately and take the recording with them mm -hmm. and sort of somehow giving them access to a recording, say, via web or I mean, these days in a YouTube world, right, you're a professional, but you really want every moment of your professional interaction with your clients being recorded and possibly showing up on YouTube tonight. So so, so it does cut both ways, right? And hopefully there are legal precedents which prevent patients from just sort of casually taking this information and publicizing it. Right, because it is two people's voice being recorded as well. I mean, there, I mean Washington state law, and most state, I mean, it, it varies by state, but Washington is a dual consent law uh, state, I believe, so both parties have to be informed before you can record. So, I mean, I mean, the interaction that you described is the correct one. You ask the doctor, and they have to agree. Yeah. But if they do, then you're in the clear. Right, but for me, the question is, I might want to let you record it for your own personal use, but I may not be granting you access to put it on YouTube tonight. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so, there's, so there's, I don't, not, there's not that level. I don't know that the law covers that. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really. So you can understand the concern for a professional about having these things recorded routinely. Yes. Yes. I, yep, one, a couple of slides ago, you had sort of remarked up of uh, an interface that had to do with recording mm -hmm. the session and making sure your questions were answered. And I didn't quite catch. Was that intended to be like something that the user would have on a mobile device or would have? Is it for the clinic the clinician? Yeah, our intent was to have it on like a tablet, like an iPad, um, that the patient could control and take into the visit. Um, what we're doing now is um, we have connections with a GI oncology clinic that's very interested in this um, option. And so I don't think, at, at least at the research stage, you have to have buy-in from both sides, particularly for something like this. Um, but they were very excited about this notion of being able to have something in the visit that made it very clear to everybody what kinds of things they had to cover from both parties, um, to be able to check them off, keep track of that information. Um, they actually wanted, which we hadn't thought about, they wanted access to this too. So they wanted to be able to see in their chart what did they cover in the agenda, what things were left undone that they were supposed to do um, later. That requires having negotiation with the clinical IT system, which is, turns out to be somewhat challenging. But, um, but I, at least we had a lot of enthusiasm um, on both sides for something along these lines, in that particular clinic at least. 
back there. Okay. I had two questions. One regarding, so you mentioned at the beginning that patients are also have their own lives, right? So they need to manage both. So does it also uh, apply to the way you manage the calendar and uh, the social network? Do they use the same calendar and social network that they use to manage their own life, right? People live in Facebook. They, so is this the same social network? Is it different? Is it the same calendar I use to manage my office work and stuff like that, or is it, or I have to go to a different calendar, this is one thing. And another thing relates to more, uh, so you, you mentioned uh, the fact that people can record how they feel and stuff like that. This can also be used to have kind of a, a closed control loop medical system, which ends up the doctor can specify, oh, I expect, you know, after I give you this medicine, after three days, this could happen, and so on and so forth and can track that. Have you been thinking or considering doing something like that? Yeah, so you got several good questions there. Um, one, the first one is kind of this notion of integration with the other tools that people are already using. In terms of the social support, we designed it as a Facebook Connect application before Facebook Connect died. Um, and so the idea was that um, we would have still have control over the privacy issues, but be able to um, post to particular groups on people's walls of their existing Facebook account and to really be able to use existing social networking sites. Since then, um, we've kind of backed off from that because Facebook has not played nice um, in terms of letting us have access to that and in terms of just changing the whole privacy settings out from under us all the time. So that's pretty worrisome from a health privacy perspective. So we've kind of closed off that avenue and it's all internal now, which I don't think is the right approach. Um, I would much rather be connected to things like Facebook that people are already using. In terms of calendaring integration, um, this all uses a Google Calendar. So it's, um, it's just adding links basically into an existing Google Calendar. That was very important to people to actually see multiple calendars together. And the Google Calendar actually had the ability to, for you to hide your, um, your health calendar um, when you wanted to. That was also very important to people. They didn't always want to have their health situation in their face. Um, so those kinds of things we thought were pretty important. In terms of your, your second point about kind of this notion of a closed loop notion is, is the way you described it. I also think of that as kind of a clinical alert issue of kind of this gets back to this point of keeping track of the data and connecting the data back to the clinic of being able to send alerts to the clinic and say, okay, this patient has a very worrisome symptom right now. Um, and that could mean that they're um, reacting very badly to the chemotherapy and they need support now. Um, I think those kinds of issues would be really important and uh, good to incorporate. They also include a lot of um, implementation logistical issues for integration and actually liability issues mm. that, that are pretty tricky to do from a research perspective. We're interested in that, but I'm not sure we would ever want to be the people deploying that from a, that perspective. Scott have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, I was just looking up the what states were single party consent states. Um, I, was, uh, I was curious, uh, I couldn't remember, um, have you guys done any of your either studies uh, or the formative studies or deployments in a single consent, single party consent state? And have you thought about doing that and, and asking some patients like try recording all of your, um, all of your clinic visits? audio and then putting them into the system so you can review them later. Because obviously for a dual party, it's going to be harder to run that study since you have to give permission every time. Right. Your study can fail at any point when, once you get a doctor refused. But in a single um, party, you, can say you don't even have to tell a doctor you're doing it. Yeah, although I, I would probably have be a little hesitant to do that just from my own ethics point of view. But um, the way that we are running it here is that we have the clinicians kind of sign a blanket consent form that they're willing to be recorded in any of their visits with any of the patients unless they specifically want an opt-out for a particular appointment, which could happen, and we wanted to allow for that. Um, but then we don't have to deal with consent forms every single appointment and all that kind of thing. And they've, they've been pretty amenable to that. So, uh, and at least for here, that's been okay. 
I mean, there's even the possibility. No, it's okay. mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, there's even the possibility of something that I was looking at. I was working in this area a while ago with like you know recording and, and browsing recorded conversations. One thing that people looked at, but like basically like you know you know you you uh, you have a recording and then the clinician in this case would basically first before they handed it off to the patient in this case they would have a chance to review and black out certain portions. So they'd be able to redact beforehand and they spend a little bit of time and the researchers are trying to make this fast for them so they wouldn't spend a lot of time doing it. But so they wouldn't end up in the situation where it's like, well, they made some off-color joke or something, and that's not, you know, what ends up on YouTube. Um, but the parts that, that really contain information, the patient would still be. Uh, yeah, but I think you've hit on the key issue is that the time. The time. That's doing that is not that non-trivial, <laughs> and the worry. <coughs> there, so. I also just wanted to realize that um, Julie Keynes is one of the people we're working on for this um, future work research project. So some of these ideas came out of talks with her as well. So the question I had was um, the, the same as the other person. Um, have you looked into integrating with the existing social networks? Because there's an interesting aspect. I was reading a research study on how the existing social networks are insular in the sense that you only get to know about the good things happening with your friends and your social circle. You never get to know the bad things that would be happening. Somebody is married, somebody is uh, getting married or having kids, that's all fine, but people also want to know um, the difficulties that those people are facing. Have you looked into that aspect of, uh, of, of, of integrating the health information with the wider social network? Yeah, I mean, that, that actually was part of the design consideration for the social aspect of it. And Part of the reason why we thought it was good to have that connection to some of the health information like that is in Health Vault and PHRs so that you could choose to share things like your, you know, depression scale or your just overall mood with your social network so that they had a sense of, of where you were in that, in that point of view. Um, or probably energy level. Um, those kinds of things. And, and people would make up, we had a, um, a chart where you could choose the kinds of things you wanted to track. We also had a way for them to just enter their own kind of thing to track. And people had a variety of different things that they wanted to be able to keep track of. And some of which they would share pretty widely with their social network, particularly because it, um, it was a way to get things back too. Um, if, if people knew that they were really at a bottom low energy level and they also knew that you know they had a small child to take to school then they would get offers of help to try and, and deal with the rest of the things that were happening in their life so although there were privacy concerns um, the benefit from sharing seemed to largely outweigh those concerns in, in a lot of cases as long as they felt comfortable they had a sense of what was being shared with whom um, an observation that I think that may lead into a question. Um, <clears throat> it seems that a, a the typical social networks, online social networks, are pretty broad circles, whereas the kind of uh, social network you might invoke when you have a chronic illness might be sort of a tighter care circle. It might be just you know, family and really close friends. Yeah. So did you find anything about how people negotiated that if they were thinking about using yeah, well actually as part of Meredith's thesis, she did a lot of work along those lines of really looking at how people share information. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess fortunately or unfortunately, the answer is it varies a lot. There would be people who wouldn't want to share any health information with their mother, mm -hmm. but would share it with their, you know, person they go to church with. Um, so the conclusion from that is that people need really fine grain controls and there really aren't any presets that you can come up with other than make it utterly private all the time, which is what our default setting is. And if you don't want it utterly private, meaning no one can see it, then you have to change it. Um, so that was one of our compromises for dealing with that. I mean, we tried to, in connecting with Facebook, our idea was to use these Facebook groups notions to be able to let people have finer grain control so that it wasn't broadcast to if you have 300 friends on your Facebook account, that you know, you're getting chemotherapy and you're throwing up. Um, instead, it was broadcast to the 15 people who are your close colleagues or um, dance friends or parents of your kid or friends of parents of your kids, so that kind of thing. Um, 
but, uh, but yeah, it was very challenging to try and integrate with them along those lines. So you mentioned the fact that uh, it's known that uh, a strong social network actually get better outcome if you have a strong support for it. <coughs> but you're making here a, a kind of a causality assumption that if I'll enhance the social network, it will enhance my, my outcome, which is, does it, has any, does it have any support that this is indeed what, what will happen? So it could be that just people that have strong bonds with their environment tend to have better outcomes. So the fact that you'll generate a, a social network for someone who's asocial will actually will not create any benefit. So do you have any? You know, I don't think those kinds of studies have been done in terms of randomized control trials, and even there you always, you know, you're still getting correlations, not real causation, um, as best you can see. Um, you know, we don't know for sure, but it is something that we have some control over and we can try and influence, and if there's a possibility it's going to make it better, um, then I think we should, we should go for that. I think the next power cut will give you an experiment for free. Some people will be disconnected because of the power cut. The next power cut? Power cut, yes. I was just going to say, for somebody who is socially connected, it's still hard to ask for help. Yeah. And that's the value. Yeah, I, I think Because so. I have a hard time, but when I too, did yeah. actually ask for help in a different situation, yeah. it made a difference. Yeah. And yeah. I was really grateful. So that's, I think, really key on the social aspect. Yeah, I, I see this more as a means of leveraging your existing network rather than getting the most you know, help you can out of it, rather than actually making mm -hmm. new connections. Maybe you do that too because you'd meet other survivors, patients, and right. The peer -to -peer support. It seems like just yeah, like what Lucy's saying, like just being able to yeah, like have that quilt of these are my needs. You know, people come and help would greatly ease the burden of going away from the abstract. Can anyone help? You know. I'm just wondering though, in the you know, in the fact that you're doing all this kind of easing, so this is going to be more and more often. You know, I've, how would that affect the fact that you know it's all, you're always getting help? You know, after a while, basically when you're asking people, like, oh, whatever. I mean, you, yeah, yeah. No, it's Actually, that was a concern, um, particularly expressed by the oncologist for um, what we call cancer patients with metastatic disease. So that means there isn't as much a six-month intense period, but it's actually probably going to be like three years that their life is going to suck until they die, um, and. There, her concern was, well, so what if the social network peters out there? If, um, if they stop being supportive? Because, you know, it's a long haul here. Um, that is part of what we were trying to do with the helping quilt, was to try to make that, the help visible and try and encourage the feedback and make it visible. But it is, it is harder when you're talking about a long haul process. Social, so it's awkward to ask help, you know, from someone. But at the same time, when you really need it, you know, you kind of overcome this barrier, like, ah, uh, yeah, what, whatever. I'm just asking it, and so that makes it, you know, kind of more episodic, uh -huh. but like you rare. Yeah. And in that case, you're almost sure, 100 percent sure, that if you ask for it, you're gonna get it. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, there is an interesting negotiation that yeah. happened there. I mean, no, it might even be possible to. You know, like, you know, in the quilt, you could actually have, if you know you're going to have a metastatic kind of situation, if you could actually time slice and say, like, I need people to sign up, not really just for duties, but to say that, like, I need some friends who are going to be really, you know, on, on call, like, the first three months, some people for the next three months, and kind of, like, schedule out your friends and say, you don't have to worry and help, you know, for the first three months. It's just this period, you know, where really Actually, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of details that I didn't talk about here in terms of we looked at issues of what we call a proxy. Mm -hmm. So we found some people that had really sophisticated networks where they would have a meal coordinator and a drive to the chemotherapy appointment coordinator and a child care coordinator. So they would have designated friends <coughs> whose job it was to coordinate the help for those particular areas. Or there's, you know, my contra dance friend coordinator. Mm -hmm. And so um, some of the things we also built in was ways to help um, have these kind of proxy people who would have, you know, fine grain control over some aspect of the help and, and be able to help organize things. I'm also wondering if you wouldn't have an interesting benefit in having, you know, establishing this kind of symmetric thing. So even if you're sick and you have cancer, maybe you can help the other people, which makes you feel better. 
So instead of just asking, you know, one direction, you're going to just bring me a meal every day. And maybe there is something that I can do so... Yeah, the reciprocity thing does, it, you know, yeah. does like, kick in. Yeah, we hadn't really built in for any kind of reciprocity issue other than the visibility. Like maybe I wear short-ish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but... Yeah. Do you have uh, any one more? Yeah. So how is this, how is the health we were uh, different from patients like me? What would you consider to be the core differences? Um, patients like me is really focused on the quantitative data of collecting signs and symptoms. Health Weaver is really trying to be a lot more broad than that in terms of um, helping somebody manage all aspects of their health information. Patients like me doesn't worry about issues like question lists for the appointment. Um, it certainly doesn't look at issues of coordinating help or you know caring for your child or whatever. It's more of the symptom tracking and really keeping close tabs on that, which is an important thing um, and a nice thing to share with your peers. But I th see that as one part of the bigger picture. Cool. So uh, Wanda does have one more half hour slot. She's got a pretty full schedule today out here, but she's got one more half hour slot if anyone wants, uh, wants a one-on-one -on -one with her. But thank you. <laughs>